innovators and researchers. And I would like to call upon Professor Gautam Paul, Associate Professor and Head Cryptology and Security Research Unit, Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. Hello, welcome, Hello. Doctor. Hello. Yeah. Nice to be here. Thank you. You can please share your screen and begin your presentation. Please. Sure. We have 15 minutes to present. Okay. Okay, so is my screen visible? Yeah, we can see your screen. Please go. Okay, fine. And uh, I think uh, my sound is also okay, right? Am I audible uh, perfectly? Hello? I think you are muted, Vikash. No, you can start. I'm not able to hear you. You can begin. Okay, you are able to hear us. Okay, yeah. fine. Great. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this session, Research and Innovation Demonstration in this Quantum Security Symposium. So I would like to begin with uh, some selected works in the quantum domain and how that relates to cryptography or security in general. Okay. So I have been working on quantum foundations uh, quantum information, quantum cryptography, quantum thermodynamics, uh, quantum games, quantum computation, as well as attacks on classical cryptography uh, with my research group at ISI Kolkata. Uh, in this talk, I will focus uh, mostly on quantum cryptography. But at the end, I will also touch upon uh, the issues with quantum foundation and quantum information that we have found very recently, some interesting results and we're trying to find their link with cryptography as well. And uh, <clears throat> this quantum games, that is also quite interesting. And uh, actually this, we worked on quantum secret sharing. We tried to create a game theoretic model uh, inside quantum secret sharing that how to uh, model the rational behavior by the players and the Nash equilibrium thereof. So it is indirectly connected to quantum cryptography, but uh, I will exclude that. Uh, uh, today's session. In quantum computation, we actually analyzed the statistical error modeling in IBM uh, quantum experience hardware platform. And uh, uh, we found that actually different qubits have different errors and it's actually asymmetric. Okay, so uh, let's go to quantum cryptography. So there are several aspects of quantum cryptography. Quantum field distribution is just uh, one aspect of it, but uh, there are many such primitives. So one interesting primitive is quantum secure direct communication. As opposed to quantum cryptography uh, in using uh, quantum key distribution. So in QKD, the main idea is that uh, Alice and Bob, they will share a classical bit string via quantum mechanical method. And that classical bit string will work as a secret key for future communication, right? So here the message that is being transmitted in QKD, the message that is being transmitted is actually classical bits, right? They are encoded into quantum, but actually they are classical bits. Whereas in uh, QSDC protocol, there, there is no uh, key involved. The message from Alice directly goes to Bob's end via quantum mechanical process. So there is a subtle difference between the two. If we think uh, from conceptual point of view, the above diagram shows QKD and the diagram at the bottom shows QSDC. So both are basically sending some messages. In the above, the message happens to be a secret key for future communication. And in the below, the message happens to be the actual message that Alice wants to send to Bob. It, it just goes into, uh, goes via one hop. No need, uh, no need for establishing a secure key or doing uh, you know, an encryption or decryption kind of thing. It's about uh, quantum encoding and quantum measurement, that's all. So what is the challenge? The challenge is that when you do quantum key distribution, you share the message, then you have no control over the key positions, key bit positions. So suppose you send 100 bits of message, right? And after the end of the protocol, 
you may end up selecting say bit the fifth bit then the 11th bit maybe then the 17th bit then the 25th bit then 40th bit and so on so these positions will be random they can vary randomly and neither alice nor bob have any control over those positions they will just emerge out of their synchronization they are matching certain you know measurement bases and reconciliation right so uh, if we try to use uh, the rock ukd for sending an actual message there will be problem because uh, random portions of the message will be truncated and the message will not reach only certain selected bits of the message will go so we need some modification there and that is actually done in qsdc so there are a lot of work in last uh, two decades on qsdc there are several variants of that particularly i would like to focus here on one work which is on measurement device independent uh, quantum secured rate communication protocol so mdi is a general class of protocol where we assume that the measurement device at alice's end and the measurement device at bob's end may be actually compromised so maybe the the attacker himself or herself ha is the manufacturer of those devices and they have plugged in some components which can transmit you know records of their operations that they are doing records of intermediate results to an adversary so you can imagine this to be analogous to side channel attacks in classical domain so the goal of an mdi protocol is uh, in assuming that your device is compromised how do you design the protocol so that you can still achieve at the end of the protocol your desired goal maybe at the expense of few additional uh, qubits so that is the general mdi setting and then we apply it to qsdc now there has been an mdi qsdc protocol since uh, 2018 but we showed that there is an attack so we mounted the attack and we showed that a significant amount of bits can be leaked via that attack and then we proposed a, a, a revised version of mdi protocol that actually gets rid of those attack right so the details are in this paper which you can look into the references here and i'd like to go on to the next topic which is device independent quantum private query this is an interesting client server uh, application so assume bob is the database server and alice as the database client now in the private query setting the goal is that alice will query on certain data and bob will respond the required data however there are two privacy requirement one side of the privacy requirement is that alice should get only the data she is asking for by any tricks or whatsoever alice should not be able to access any other data that is not of her interest the uh, the second side of the privacy is that bob should not know which data alice is querying upon which particular data alice is requesting bob should not know that so that will ensure client side privacy but still bob should be able to respond in such a way that alice will recover the desired data from bob sin so that's the uh, private query setting in general now when you lift the private query setting to quantum information quantum messages it becomes quantum private query and then when you make it device independent that's a different terminology from measurement device independent right so in measurement device independent you only assume that your measurement devices are compromised but other devices like devices used for quantum encoding maybe for some quantum operations uh, some unitary operations those you have to assume those are perfectly secure but in device independent quantum protocol you can assume that all your quantum devices may be compromised and still you can run a particular protocol right so this is some work that we did in this domain for interesting you know cloud based client server protocol uh, to secure privacy both on the client side and on the bob side in the device independent fashion so the reference is here Now the third work that I would like to describe is optimal attacks on quantum cryptography. So this is a generic, uh, you know, QKD protocol. You can see that Alice prepares uh, her qubits, transmits over the quantum channel. Bob's detects 
does some measurement and then there is some reconciliation by both. Now, if uh, due to no cloning uh, theorem, Eve cannot create a copy of the qubits that is being transmitted. So Eve has two options. Either Eve can do some measurement and resend those qubits, but then Eve is going to introduce uh, certain uh, errors because the, uh, the bits on which the qubits on which Eve will do the measurement will collapse, right? So a second option that Eve has is not to measure, but Eve will have some, some ancilla qubits at her disposal and Eve will uh, do some operation, some joint operation on the qubits being transmitted on the channel and the qubits at her disposal. So Eve will do some joint quantum operation on these two sets of qubits and then let the qubits on the quantum channel go to Bob. So, and then Eve expects that, you know, under that operation, some information in that qubits will come to her ancillary qubits. So after, the transmission is over, Eve will do some offline analysis of her ancillary qubits and try to uh, retrieve some information about the protocol, about the qubits that are being shared. Now, in the year 2000, roughly 21 years back, there were some works on optimal attacks and people have shown that there are two specific uh, operations that Eve can do to create the optimality. Optimality in the sense that Eve can gain maximum amount of information, creating least amount of disturbance uh, to Bob's and least amount of noise. So that's optimality from attacker's point of view. Now, what we've shown uh, for last 20 years, it was an open problem that uh, whether only these two operations make the attack optimal from Eve's side. So the open question was, are there any other method of doing optimal attacks? Then what are those? Can we characterize those? So we actually completely solved this problem with uh, the help of one of my PhD student. And basically we characterized the set of all optimal attacks and the set of all operations that if can mount uh, to achieve the optimality. Okay. So there are two results on this. Uh, the very recent one came just recently in European Physics uh, Journal. Okay, uh, next I would like to talk about some uh, quantum attacks on classical ciphers. So typically when we uh, talk about quantum attacks, the only thing that comes to our mind is uh, Grover's attack, which basically reduces the key size to half. So if you have a 128 bit cipher, then due to Grover's square root advantage, your search space reduces to two to the power 64 rather than two to the power 128. So basically, if you double your key size, then you are safe. Now, very recently, there are some special attacks which not only uses Grover's trick, but also uses Simon's algorithm and also uses periodicity in the functions that are used as, uh, you know, in the classical primitives. So it uses all of that to mount a, a hybrid attack, a combination of classical quantum attacks. And in this hybrid attack, there are two models. The Q1 model says that the attacker is allowed to make uh, only classical queries. No quantum queries is allowed, but the attacker can access to a quantum computer to make offline computation. Whereas in Q2 model, the attacker is given uh, more privileges. So the attacker can uh, make both classical query as well as superposition queries to the oracle, quantum superposition queries. So Q2 model is uh, more advantageous than uh, Q1 model from attacker's point of view. And recently we have uh, done some work on that. Uh, basically we have worked on each CTR based and uh, hash functions, attacks on them uh, and got published into ITP transactions recently. Then the last two uh, works I would like to mention on quantum foundation and information. Okay, So this work uh, that I'm going to talk about now, I have named it separation of distinguishable and indistinguishable particles, okay? So we have to know what does it mean by distinguishable and indistinguishable particle. Distinguishable particle means particles which you can label. So either you can label by their polarization or spin or some you know, degrees of freedom or by their location. Whereas the indistinguishable means that they are identical in all respect. They are 
<clears throat> you know state of their <clears throat> what i do say state of their uh, degrees of freedom they are all identical except possibly uh, uh, their spatial location right so but uh, how they are made indistinguishable that is being shown here so suppose these are the two wave functions of the two particles then they are made spatially close together so initially they are spatially separated but after their wave functions overlap and this is called a particle exchange type of mechanism so they become indistinguishable now even if you move the particles apart so even if their wave functions are separated uh, conceptually but actually they will be indistinguishable so in this setting uh, we show that there has been some work uh, people have been doing that there are some properties and applications of distinguishable particles and people have been trying to extend those to indistinguishable particles and vice versa so it was thought that whatever protocols and applications can be achieved using distinguishable particles probably all of them can be achieved using indistinguishable particles also but maybe with different parameter values with different efficiency now we showed that this is not possible not all properties of distinguishable properties can be uh, brought forward to indistinguishable ones there is a separation so we show actually to no go result that no hyperhybrid entangled state will exist for distinguishable particle that can exist only for indistinguishable particle that is one separation result and second separation result is that no unit fidelity quantum teleportation is possible using indistinguishable particle that is possible only using distinguishable particle the third one uh, that we show yes wind up in the interest okay. of time sure two minutes okay, okay. So the third application that we show uh, is entanglement swapping. That is very critical for you know, quantum cryptography, quantum key distribution over long distance. If you want to stretch your QKD from, you know, 10 meters to 100 meters, 100 kilometers, 1,000 kilometers, and so on, you have to do entanglement swapping. So that is possible using only two indistinguishable particles. But if you use distinguishable particles, you need to use four. So the last work uh, in the last minute that I will describe is on monogamy of entanglement. Uh, many of you are aware that if Alice and Bob are perfectly entangled, maximally entangled, then neither of them can be entangled with a third party. And this property is used to argue about security of you know, quantum distribution protocol as well as many other quantum protocol. That if we use entangled pairs, then we are secure because Eve cannot be entangled. Now, what you show here that though monogamy of entanglement is a generic uh, you know principle a generic result still there are violations possible in fact maximum amount of violation is possible using indistinguishable particles so this is a counter intuitive result but the trick is that uh, for distinguishable particles monogamy violation will lead to violation of no cloning theorem but we show here that for indistinguishable particles uh, monogamy violation does not lead to violation of no cloning theorem so we are good and uh, how these results, these last two results that I talked about can be applied in quantum cryptography, that is uh, still open and we're working on that. Okay, so with this, I would like to stop my presentation. I tried to give an overview of different fields related to quantum cryptography and security that I have been working on. And I'll be open to any question or comments that you may have. Uh, because you are, uh, I think, inaudible to unmute. Thanks, Paul, for that presentation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, thank you for joining us today. And now I would like to invite our second presenter of the day, Dr. Minakshi Kansal, who is a postdoctoral fellow at IIT Madras. Mm -hmm. Hi, welcome, Dr. Kansal. Thank you. You can please share your screen and start the presentation. All right. Perfect, you can begin. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the Quantum Security Symposium. So let's get started. First, let us see what is the impact of quantum computer on cryptographic primitives that are currently in use. Let us see 
let us look at this table. This table, uh, the data I have taken from uh, NIST report, one of the report of NIST. So if we see, look at this table, it says us that the AES algorithm requires larger key sizes to be secure in the quantum domain. Similarly, for SHA, that means for the hash functions family, we need larger output. And now if we see the last two, two rows, that is the RSA and elliptic curve cryptography, you can see that the last column clearly says that it is no longer secure. And of course, we know uh, it is because of the celebrated result of Peter Shor's algorithm that has come in, that, that came in the year 1994. So with this table, we have come to know that public key cryptography in quantum domain, we have to, is completely collapsed. We have to think of something different. And of symmetric key cryptography, we have some hope. If we look at this table, it just says use larger key sizes or output, larger output, whatever, whichever is applicable. And then we are safe in that, right? We are safe in quantum computer, quantum world, let us say. All right. So, but to be more uh, ensure about it, we have another result, which says that an exponential speed up for such algorithm is impossible. Now we are saying that for AES and hash, fun hash function or any symmetric key cryptography, we need to take the larger key sizes. And that is because of the Grover's algorithm, Grover's search algorithm that is the best known till date. And again, we have another result which says an exponential speed up is not possible for any search algorithm. So that means whatever speed we can have, the best we can do is polynomial speed and that we can that we can bear. That means symmetric key cryptography is safe in quantum domain just with little here and there's a larger key sizes and all. So what is more worried, what we have to worry like about what we have to think on more is public key cryptography because this slide completely says that RSA and elliptic curve is completely collapsed. So what do we want? What is actually collapsed? When we say RSA collapsed, elliptic curve collapsed, or dis discrete log, it means what actually collapsed? Collapse, the collapse here means the problem is no more hard on quantum machine. That means the solution is very simple. Just take out those problems which are hard on quantum machine. And that is exactly what we do in post quantum cryptography. The cryptography which is based on those mathematical problems which are hard even on quantum machine is known as post quantum cryptography. All right. Now, again, I would like here to mention that post quantum cryptography and quantum cryptography, sometimes we get confused and we treat them as one, but no, they are totally two different sciences. They are fundamentally different post quantum cryptography and quantum cryptography. Quantum cryptography uses quantum mechanics, laws of physics to build cryptography. But what post quantum cryptography does, we do not use any quantum hardware or quantum proper properties. Quant post quantum cryptography uses the same infrastructure, the same hardware which we have now. But it changes the algorithm. Where it was algorithms were using uh, integer factorization problem or discrete logarithm problems, it uses some new problems. That is the only change. All right. So there are many families. One of the most promising is lattice based cryptography. I'll just give the geometrical um, understanding of lattice and only one problem I will define here. So this is a lattice. Lattice is set of points which are arranged periodically. So if we see at the left side, the left side is the simplest lattice we can think of. It is an integer lattice. Now the left side figure shows us two dimensional lattice. Now any other lattice, just take any linear transformation, operate on this integer lattice and you will get a new lattice. So any other lattice can be derived from this integer lattice by using any linear transformation. So 
this is the geometrical explanation of the lattice. I'm not giving the algebraic definition here. Now let us see one hard problem, shortest vector problem. This problem says, this problem demands that given a lattice, lattice is given means basis is given, here B1 and B2 are the basis because we now we are, this uh, figure shows us two dimensional lattice. So we have B1 and B2 as the basis. Given this basis, now the problem demands us to find a non-zero vector which is which has the shortest length in this lattice okay so it demands us to find out the shortest vector who had the vector has the shortest length that means we need to find the shortest vector that is the reason this is called shortest vector problem all right now maybe uh, Finding the shortest vector is quite tedious. So can we do better than finding the shortest vector? Can we find some approximation to this uh, shortest vector? Can we, can we do that? Again, even this problem is very hard to, find, to solve in polynomial time. So approximate shortest vector problem says, not only lambda 1, you give me a vector, non-zero lattice vector, which is at most gamma times lambda 1. Now what is gamma here? This is the important thing that we have to uh, look at. What is gamma? Now gamma is, suppose this gamma I am saying it is uh, exponential in the dimension of the lattice. Then this problem is no more hard. As soon as gamma becomes exponential in the dimension of the lattice, this problem is not hard because we have in the literature, there is an algorithm, triple L algorithm. I'm mentioning one, there might be other algorithms as well. Triple L algorithm, which solves this problem when gamma is an exponential, is an exponential factor. So this problem is hard when gamma is a polynomial factor in the dimension of the lattice all right so what do we have now so we can say because after lot of study till now we do not have any polynomial time algorithm so we can conjecture it that there is no polynomial time algorithm that approximates lattice problems to within polynomial factors again this polynomial factors is important because if it is exponential factors this problem is easy all right. So, but what do we want actually? Why are we studying lattice? I mean, for the cryptographic uh, purpose, we are studying it definitely for other few reasons. But the main reason we are studying, we are looking at this. These problems are because we think that these are hard for hard for quantum computers to solve. But are are these lattice problems really hard for quantum computers? And the answer to this question is yes, it is hard even for quantum computers. Why, why, what is the evidence? Well, we can say there is, there exists no efficient algorithm till now, quantum algorithms, which can solve lattice problems. All right. And see, if we see integer factorization and discrete log problems, why do we say those are not secure? Because we have quantum algorithms, that is the Shor algorithm, and it has uh, it came in the year 1994. Now it's almost approximately 25 years, I think. And we have no solution. We are not, we have no idea how to use even short algorithm to get a solution to solve uh, lattice problems. Right. Actually, where it goes wrong, where it goes wrong, short algorithm, if you look closely, short algorithm actually uses period finding algorithm. It uses period finding algorithm for an abelian group. Okay. And we do not know how to use that period finding algorithm for abelian group to solve lattice problems. So can we think that lattice problems quantum helps quantum does not help us to solve lattice problems. No, this is not the case. Quantum will definitely, actually quantum helps us to solve lattice problems. But the thing is, we do not know how to use it. 
there is a result by ordered regev it has appeared in 2004 this result uh, proves that if we if we know how to find period for the non abelian groups then that algorithm can be used to solve lattice problems now see there are two things abelian groups and non abelian groups abelian groups we have used that period finding algorithm of abelian groups to solve integer factorization and discrete log problem now if we can find period finding algorithm an efficient period finding algorithm for non abelian groups we can even solve lattice problems so quantum helps but we do not know how to solve this problem and if we generalize this problem this problem actually known as the problem i am talking about period finding in general this problem is known as hidden subgroup problem so we know hidden subgroup problem how to solve for abelian groups but we do not know how to solve hidden subgroup problem for non abelian groups now to be more specific uh we know uh, the had dihedral and symmetric groups are non abelian groups now if we can solve to find the period for dihedral group that means if we can solve the hidden subgroup problem for dihedral group then we can solve lattice problems it is not that directly svp will be solved but there is a reduction again if we have a um, hidden subgroup solution an efficient algorithm for hidden subgroup problem for dihedral group we can solve lwe problem that means learning with errors problem and there is a reduction which says if we have an algorithm for lwe problem we can use that algorithm to solve sivp problem so there is a connection so once we have the solution for hidden subgroup problem for dihedral group then we can solve lattice problem and if if we say symmetric group that if we have a hidden subgroup problem for symmetric group because even symmetric group is a non abelian group then we can solve group isomorphism problem uh, sorry graph isomorphism problem so again we can conjecture now that there is no polynomial time quantum algorithm in the previous slide we were talking about the classical algorithm now this says about the quantum algorithm that there is no polynomial time quantum algorithm that approximates lattice problems to be the polynomial factors all right now what can we do with lattice definitely definitely one thing is we can redo old cryptography right see whenever we have whenever we do cryptography now one might think we when we already have why to remake it why to redo old cryptography with lattice so one thing is when we do cryptography using different assumptions we understand it better right and definitely lattice we believe it to be quantum uh, resistant so it's good to have uh, good to doing this old cryptography under the hardness of lattice problems all right so what is more exciting is of course redoing old cryptography is of course a great thing it's exciting but what is more exciting more exciting is if we can have new primitives which we didn't know how to how to do with previous assumptions or other assumptions right if we see fully homomorphic encryption this problem was open for almost 30 years we didn't know how to achieve this fully homomorphic encryption and now we know this using lattices that means under the hardness of lattice problems we can have the cryptographic primitive which is fully homomorphic encryption which is amazing now what is fully homomorphic encryption okay let us say i have some data x okay and i want to compute on that data let me say i want to compute f of x okay i want to compute f of x and let us make one more assumption that computing f of x suppose takes lot of computation and that is what i lack i do not have that much computation power to compute f of x now what what can i do a simple solution is i'll approach to a party who has this 
computing power i'll ask him to do this for me take this take my data and i want this functionality give me f of x back fine well done but what if my data is sensitive what if i do not want to share my data with the with any other party in that case what can i do now i i have nothing i i do not have computation power my data is sensitive i cannot give to some other party to compute it so now what can i do fully homomorphic encryption helps us in this it says it says you encrypt your data that means i will encrypt my data as the data is sensitive i cannot hand over in clear to a party i will encrypt the data and then i will give that encrypted data to a party and this fully homomorphic en encryption is so amazing that if i give this encryption of x to a party and then that party taking the encryption of x and f the functionality f it will compute on encryption encrypted data and it will give me encryption of f of x right now see the beauty i have given the encryption of x now i have solved both my problems i wanted f of x and i didn't want to give my data now i am giving my data in encrypted form he will not learn anything if this of course if this encryption whatever encryption i am using is secure so i and i am encrypting my data i am giving it to the cloud giving the function that you give me compute on my encrypted data and then cloud will compute on my encrypted data and will give me back encryption of f of x and as i have encrypted i have the secret key right i have my secret key i will encrypt it and i will get back f of x so my f of x i got dr kansal if you could please wrap up the presentation in next 30 seconds yeah That's sure clear. sure i'm done almost okay so i have i can get back my functionality f of x and also i have not shown anything to the cloud my data is safe and i got my functionality functionality so this is a beauty of fully homomorphic encryption and fully homomorphic encryption we have achieved using lattices all right so this is all i wanted to say thank you if there is any doubt any question i can take thank you so much dr kansal that was really uh, a learned presentation to even you and i thank you for being with us today now i would like to invite on stage mr kanak kawadi wale ceo and founder of arishti cybertech kanak please yeah you can okay, share your screen lot, and uh, begin vikas. thanks thanks vikas am i audible yeah you are audible kanak because uh, just to make sure if it is visible and yeah. i'm uh, audible i can see your presentation you can start thanks thanks vikas so uh, to begin with thanks a lot uh, national center of excellence uh, dsci and qno labs for inviting me and uh, uh, representing myself at uh, arishti cybertech private limited so uh, to give a brief about uh, you know what are we doing at arishti cybertech uh, and uh, what what product we are building out of uh, quantum technology so so uh, we are a cyber security startup being uh, supported by sign iit bombay and coep pune we are based out of pune and uh, we we at arishti are currently uh, developing a next generation enterprise messaging platform uh, which is powered by quantum technology uh, more on the quantum technology we are uh, more focused on the applications and how we are using quantum technology in order to secure to strengthen the uh, security of our product and provide the ultimate hack proof solutions to the enterprises for their sensitive communications so we are more focused on the sensitive communications within enterprises uh to to start with uh, i'll just uh, i'll just uh, you know want to talk, uh, talk about uh, why why choose quantum security and uh, what excited us to work on this solution so that it can help our customers and the enterprises so uh, we primarily think that there are three main uh, you know reasons or the problems that we see which can be overcome through the quantum security and first is uh, being the harvest now and data decrypt later 
So when we talk about, you know, harvest now and decrypt later kind of a problem, uh, harvesting encrypted data and, uh, you know, uh, making it and storing it for a large uh, duration. And, uh, you know, hoping that the quantum computing will help us to decrypt all the encrypted data later in the future. That is the problem when it comes, uh, we call it as a harvest now and decrypt later. A very good example of this uh, would be Facebook Cambridge Analytica data scandal, which happened that uh, they have been storing a lot of uh, sensitive uh, users data and they have been uh, this is the encrypted data that that they have been uh, you know storing a lot of uh, data within their data centers the next problem that i see that can be overcome through the problem uh, through the uh, quantum security is insecure communications uh, sensitive communications are not so secured these days and uh, which is meant to be highly secured but uh, the problems of manipulation and tampering of this data has become so, so easy that uh, in the communications are not at all secure. There are multiple things and multiple sectors of the domains in the quantum security that is taking place in the industry so that it can be solved through the quantum security. Lastly, the weak cryptographic keys. Uh, we hardly see nowadays that uh, none of the data which goes digitally, which is being transmitted from one place to another, it doesn't go anywhere unencrypted. And so the encryption has become a mainstream for any digital economy or any digital kind of a transmission. And weak cryptographic keys is some uh, is a very uh, you know important and niche problem statement that we find, which can be overcome through the quantum security. Using the traditional methods for you know generating the cryptographic material like cryptographic keys, session codes, OTPs, and etc., could be a vulnerable point in time for any digital systems. And that is where we think that uh, working on this problem statement could really bring a you know variation, a large variation and impact in the inter enterprises and the, in the industries. So uh, we, we, are, we were just uh, researching through uh, a lot of capabilities that how we can actually uh, use this quantum capabilities in the commercial manner and make a, a, a product out of it. So to begin with, you know, uh, there are multiple commercial matured products in the industries wherein uh, Google, IBM, Microsoft and Amazon, they have been working on this space and a lot of investment has been made in this uh, in this domain of quantum capabilities. Uh, to name few of them where uh, we have been researching a lot into this space. So we have been exploring uh, various kind of uh, uh, cloud based quantum capabilities to explore how we can actually collaborate and how we can actually integrate these systems within the platform that we are working on. So to go over with uh, uh, Google, Google being a giant in the industry, they have been working in the quantum space and they have already declared their quantum supremacy. Uh, to be more precise on this, uh, uh, I would like to make a small uh, uh, judgment on what kind of capabilities this all uh, industry giants and industry leaders have been working on. So Google have been working on recently CERC, uh, which is which is a Python based quantum computing uh, platform for open simulation and computation. Uh, many researchers I've seen they have been uh, uh, using this platform for their uh, research purpose for simulating large kind of quantum uh, mechanics and quantum simulations. Secondly, uh, Google is also developing some quantum TensorFlow, and it's it's a, a artificial AI based library which can be you know actually used for developing great models and large models and training them in very less time. Microsoft have also been uh, working in this space uh, through the Azure Quantum and open source Quantum SDK have been provided by Azure Quantum for uh, people who are researching. And they've also said that they are commercially available right now, but seems like they are into the research phase wherein they are working on making the Quantum SDK uh, available to the developers, available to the industries, enterprises to integrate within the platforms. Q Sharp language uh, supports this uh, quanta, Azure Quantum SDKs, and uh, they also have some interoperability and capabilities to work with Python and .NET. So it has really make, made sense for the developers as well as the researchers and the startups like us to explore the opportunities to integrate and to work with this uh, giants uh, so that we can integrate the quantum capabilities in the security products. <clears throat> Nextly, talking about the IBM, uh, IBM have been working a great in this and they have a very good commercial product out of uh, quantum capabilities known as QuizKit, which we are leveraging a lot uh, nowadays. So it, it's a 16-bit it's cloud-hosted quantum computer and is based out of uh, Python and JavaScript language. Uh, it's very easy to integrate and can be used for the businesses. 
quiz kit have been you know uh, openly available for the organizations and for the enterprises like uh, they have they already have customers who have been using quiz kit for their various uh, domains and for various use cases in uh, maybe we can say cyber security and also in the healthcare industry amazon is having and amazon has recently announced its its own quantum capabilities from a uh, bracket uh, which is also consisting of d wave rigat t and uh, ion q so this this kind of quantum capabilities coming out from the uh, giant industries in the market it's really good for uh, us as a startup to explore these opportunities and work upon them this really has helped us a lot in the industry sectors that uh, we are exploring those opportunities how we can use quantum capabilities when it comes to the cyber security using uh, quantum uh, technologies uh would like to more talk on the foundation of crypto systems like uh, how how this crypto systems have been uh, built and what is the foundation of them so when we go deep dive uh, uh, into this space so random number generator is you know uh, very less uh, uh, talked about uh, this this kind of a topic but when we talk about this random number generator and if you see and if you uh, go dive deep dive into this random numbers have various uh, various uh, sector kind of uh, uh, applications but we overlook them most of the time so random number generators have been used in the encryption decryption strategies like uh, to maintain the confidentiality where maintaining the confidentiality of data at uh, the transmit and at the rest is very important and so rngs are playing a very uh, vital role in the same for encryption and decryption when we look into the digital signatures the seeds which are being generated through the random number generators can be pivotal part of, of any signature generation process and the more randomness the more unique the signature is the identity authentication the identity management is very crucial part in any organizational uh, info information security or data security and lastly the session security as we talk about uh, one time security codes or one time session codes or otps those are being generated through use of the random number generators and these are the traditional random number generators so to overcome this like what is the problem actually when it comes to using the traditional encryption methods and overcoming it with the quantum technology so uh, let's try to understand what is the uh, quantum era era and how are we uh, provisioning it how are we shifting our shifting a new paradigm towards the quantum era so when we look at the random number generators uh, currently being used in the uh, you know enterprises it's it's specifically that they are based on the cosmological noise like temperature those are the true random number generators being integrated in the uh, in the applications or in any sector where there comes any kind of cryptographic uh, usage uh, secondly we talk about uh, pseudo random number generators or prngs which are based on mathematical formulations and uh, as they were so are uh, mathematically based or they have a mathematical uh, structure they can be predictable at the end we also have a hybrid which is a combination of hardware and software capabilities but when you see at a whole that this uh, trng prngs and hybrid kind of a random number generators they are the pro they have a probable randomness and this probable randomness proves to be a major vulnerable point in the security systems we at here so when we shift this towards the qrng which is known as quantum random number generators a quantum phenomenon which is being used uh, to you know highly generate the strong and the larger key generations for any security systems which integrate in the applications wherein you get a quantum safe solutions quantum safe systems and that is where we work uh, to work on the pro uh, provable randomness rather than working on a probable randomness of any product this is the a space where you know large enterprises and the organizations should really focus on a small thing but uh, uh, making an impact of a large organization uh, making a large impact on the uh, data privacy data security and everything related to the data security information security so how do we use uh, particularly this quantum technology in order to in, uh, uh, to be uh, you know integrated with the platform that we have been developing as said we are the first one we are uh, developing a message me which is known as me it's a, it's a first next generation enterprise messaging platform for sensitive communications powered by quantum technology now to be more precise on how do we use this quantum technology integrating into the platform uh, which is a mobile as well as a web application can be used commercially and is available commercially for the enterprises so that they can manage their uh, secure communication sensitive data sharing through our platforms 
So we had Arishtia using the cloud quantum random number generators uh, to, to actually use uh, it as an encryption module. We have built our own encryption module, which is really a patent pending thing that we are currently working on. So what happens is uh, your conversation when, uh, when any enterprise use this message me or uh, meme platform that is being developed by us, your, your conversations are strongly encrypted and are being protected by the cyber attacks, unlike other platforms, which are not using currently, or they're using traditional methods of encryption systems. We are using, uh, unlike other platforms, we are using cloud-based QRNG services. Many of times that we see uh, the random number generators being used in the commercial products, they are uh, they are a pseudo random number, number generators or normal random number generators. But when we see the entropy source or when we see any kind of a randomness that brings out of this platform, which is already integrated in the commercial products, it's a vulnerable, vulnerable point. And that is where we uh, at Arishti are pro uh, using uh, quantum technology or you can say cloud-based quantum technology in order to integrate it within our platform. Currently, we are exploring the opportunities and we are uh, integrating IBM Quiz Kit, as I said, uh, which is really uh, commercially viable and available to the developers, to the startups to use and to exploit their capabilities and integrate it within the uh, platforms. We are currently trying to work with this Quiz Kit and Australia National University as they also have, uh, have been working in quantum space and they've been providing quantum random number generators uh, to the industries. What are the benefits that we see, you know, uh, when it comes to a commercial viability of the product that we are building? It's it's hardly predictable. The uh, source, the entropy source that you take is a, is of quantum technology. And so the it's, a, it's a very highly unpredictable. We have quantum safe encryptions as we are using quantum random number generators to generate highly secure encryption keys and other cryptographic materials. So it's a quantum safe encryptions that we're making here and easy accessibility. So uh, as I say that there are large giants working in this industry. So uh, th it's it's very easy nowadays that you can uh, exploit and explore a lot of uh, integration capabilities which are cloud-based or which can be uh, as a hardware-based and it can be integrated easily within the IoT or applications and in any kind of things. We are using REST APIs over here so that we can integrate it to, uh, very commercially and we, it can be used uh, with the minimum kind of uh, challenges. To be more specific on this, we are we are also using zero trust architecture to make this application, to, to make this platform a very secured ones. Uh, we, we at Arishti uh, totally believe in never trust and always verify. And uh, to make these resources available through these platforms, we are using zero trust network architecture and which, which makes us, uh, which helps us in authenticating the requests and avoiding any exfiltration of the sensitive data. At the end, we at uh, Arishti, to be more precise, believe that the future of security is consent. And so we are coming up with the consent based messaging through this uh, messaging platform known as MIM. At Arishti, we believe that the platform, uh, what we have developed is more for the sensitive and the sensitive communications. And uh, this platform also consists of the data loss prevention systems, which can help the enterprises and the organizations control their uh, sh sensitive data, which is being shared over the platform and any sensitive file, which is being shared can be controlled through our platform. So these are the few things that how we are leveraging the quantum technology in order to make a product, a very secured one in the space and to make our enterprises, to make our customers uh, believe in us that we are someone who are working in the space of sensitive communications, rather than talking about the consumer grade messaging platforms. We are here at Arishti through me, and uh, we are happy to have any questions if there. Glad to be part of this uh, security symposium, quantum security symposium. Thanks for uh, inviting us, uh, QNU Labs, DSCI, and National Center of Excellence. Do reach out to us in, in, in case of any uh, pleads or any kind of discussion. I'll be happy to do that. Thanks a lot. Hello. Thank you, Connor. Thanks, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Kanak, for being with us today. And with that, I would like to invite Professor Sugata Gangopadhyay, Professor and HOD, um, IIT Roorkee. Can you hear me? Yes, Professor, we can hear you. Yes, Professor, we can hear you. Okay, so is it, uh, should I... Shall I share my screen? Professor, there's a, there's a echo from your screen. 
Yeah, Professor, you can please share your screen and start the presentation. Professor, you can please share your screen and yeah, start I'm the presentation. Trying to do that. Uh, let's see. I think it might be a problem because I was trying to. Let me see. Uh, probably, you know, this will work. As I was trying to do some writing also, but uh, what is it? There is some problem. I am unable to share the screen. That's the problem here. Um, are you getting I the option? Why? Um, are you getting the option? Yes, I am getting the option. I am clicking on it. Oh, it, it, it might be because I am opening on Safari. I mean, like, uh, I think that should I, I am wondering, should I open on Chrome? Uh, so, yeah, while Professor figures out some technical error, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Chatterjee from the team of Professor Urbasi Sena to come and give a presentation.
Yeah. So, is the slide uh, visible and visible and am I audible? Hi, because. Hi, because uh, am I audible? Audible, but we can't see the slide. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so hi, I'm Shaurabh Chatterjee, working in the Quest project with Professor Virubhushi Sinha at the Raman Research Institute as a scientist C. And uh, hi, my I'm colleague. Rishabh. Hi, I'm Rishabh. Uh, I'm a PhD scholar in the same project, working in the same project, Quest, Quest project. Uh, I'm working as a PhD student uh, under Urvashi Sinha uh, in the Raman Research Institute. Yeah, in the concluding remarks, we wanted to particularly highlight that we have filed the patent on our QCODISIM software and it will be soon available for public usage so that the experimental implementations can be tested and their performance can be well analyzed. Thank you. Yeah, uh, may I please request Professor Sugata to come on stage? Thank you. Thank you, Professor. You can share your screen and begin the presentation. Yeah. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Can you see yeah, my Professor, screen? If you can project it, that would be great. Uh, yeah, slideshow. Yeah. yeah. Start from, play from start. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think it kind of works, right? So. I don't think I'll be able to write on this uh, this thing, but anyway, so I'll quickly go uh, with, uh, wait a moment, I need to kind of keep track of time a bit. Uh, okay, so see, uh, is, it, uh, is it all right? Can you see and uh, hear me? Yeah, of course. All right. See, uh, I will be talk going a little back rather, I mean, I'll be talking about a bit of uh, Boolean functions and how they are implemented on a quantum machine. And uh, after that, I will uh, tell you that how this can be a uh, threat uh, to crypto uh, to ciphers. So first of all, please just tell me whether you are able to hear me and see the slides. Hello. Hello. Are you able to hear me? I don't know. I, anyway, I'll keep on talking. So can you hear me? I don't know, no, no sound. Anyway, so see, uh, the point is that uh, when we model a cipher, particularly a symmetric cipher, we use Boolean functions. Ultimately, we are considering some 
a function which is taking a key from the key space and after that taking a plain text and converting it to a ciphertext. So let us look at what we mean by a Boolean function. So if we have a function from n bits uh, taking n tuples to a 0 or 1, then that's a Boolean function. And if we have a n tuples going from n tuples to n tuples, so you have a sequence of n Boolean functions, then you have a vector Boolean function. But still, I'm unable to hear anyone. I don't know whether people are able to hear me or not. So now, when we are talking about a quantum computer, then we have qubits. So a bit is replaced by a qubit. And we know that a quantum computer has capability of changing the state of a bit. And we also know that we can have multiple qubit systems where uh, many qubits, a system consisting of many qubits can be created, although probably for a very short time and sustained. And we also know that when we are talking about a, uh, when we talk about quantum transformations, we always know that uh, a qubit is transformed to another qubit by using quantum gates, but these transformations are always, these transformations are always uh, reversible. We cannot think of irreversible things happening on a quantum machine. But if we go back again to Boolean functions, Boolean functions are very much irreversible because we have got n, n bits being mapped to a single bit. So it is not an invertible function. The question is, how do we implement a Boolean function on a quantum machine? And the answer is this, that we have, we, suppose we have got n qubits, so we have got a, uh, a computational basis state of uh, consisting of n qubits and we take one bit and this is the boolean function so we, we need n plus one qubits and then we use this transformation so this is called the phase bit oracle implementation of a boolean function and correspondingly we have a phase oracle implementation of the boolean function and what we can show eventually that I can go from bit oracle to phase oracle by using some quantum circuits. So we have a thing like this. And after that, the important point here is that we can use this phase oracle uh, representation of the Boolean function and construct a thing like that, this. So what is happening here, actually this platform is a little bit of a problem because neither I can see the audience, I don't know whether the audience is able to see me or not, but still, see, the a corresponding to a Boolean function, I have a unitary transformation and I have told you that I can convert this to a phase oracle uh, transformation, which is essentially like this, a function and then I can apply that transformation to a uh, to a state like this, and that gives me this. So eventually, if I have a superposition state of all the uh, domain points of a Boolean function, I can get a state like this, where the Boolean function is evaluated at all the all the domain points, and that gives the power of the quantum machine. And we can use another Hadamard uh, tensor n gate, and we can get a thing like this. And what I would like to mention here is that in classical cryptography, the nonlinearity of Boolean function is uh, related to the Walsh Hadamard coefficient of the Boolean function, and which exactly goes to this. So when we consider this uh, nonlinearity of a function, we have to evaluate this sum and take the max of that and 
on a quantum machine within one query we can get this thing as our coefficients now this is this shows that there is a possibility of getting the nonlinearity of a function that is getting the affine uh, uh, a fine approximation of a function uh, in faster and this thing gets uh, uh, these things ultimately gets changed to i mean let's transform to a problem of testing property testing of boolean functions and here we have like uh, if you have a boolean function there is a question that decide whether the function is um, linear or not and in order to decide that if you are using the the best known algorithm is order n to to the power n and there is a, a randomized algorithm that is that says that you can do it with three queries on the boolean function that is called bloom luby rubinfeld algorithm and recently we have got a um, quantum equivalent of bloom ruby rubin field algorithm and we published that and uh, of course we as can be expected that we could prove that this algorithm is um, faster than the classical algorithm it it, it converges uh, to the it is more uh, uh, gives us a better approximation than the classical blr test but of course we have to remember that this is a uh, modulo a quantum machine and it is not a very, very not a very easy thing to con to construct a, a large boolean function so that question remains uh, uh, i mean that question remains wherever we are i mean like so for example even if we are talking about doyes jutz algorithm or any other algorithm the question is that how you are going to implement a big boolean function on a quantum machine it is not easy and of course we have done we have shown that there are other kind of uh, algorithms which can kind of distinguish between certain boolean functions and recently we have got another uh, some results on some other cryptographic properties of boolean function now what do we expect happening from here that if you look at crypto, uh, cryptographic literature and you'll see that there is um, like in order to attack a uh, cipher we need we go for linear approximation of a ci of the cipher the point is that if we can do it faster uh, for larger input uh, variables it might give us some kind of linear dependence that are not possible to obtain by using the classical tests so there is a possibility in there and at other some other cases also to find some distinguishers and all we can use these things so what people are doing let us see so we we of course are looking at some of these things but if you look at the literature now we'll see that in the recent uh, past like from in last 2 3 years there is a tendency of uh, trying to uh implement uh, block ciphers on a quantum machine and then try to implement some key recovery attacks there so for example there's of course some activities coming from china and here you'll see that recently in um, pqc there is a paper from lars knudsen's group on quantum distinguishers of type 3 generalized feistel network based on separability so this is uh, an interesting paper there and otherwise there are some other uh, papers like 2017 this is also a notable paper by gregor leander and um, uh, that is grover mit simon so they uh, uh, they have somehow been able to uh, use both these uh, algorithms, Grover's algorithms and Simon's algorithm together to attack certain uh, block cipher designs. So this is more or less what I have to say.
And so the idea is that, so it looks like from the, if you look at the block cipher uh, area, there is a, uh, there is interest of trying to find out uh, good implementations, quantum implementations of uh, block ciphers and try to mount attacks based on that. But what I would always say there is a, it's, it's not really be easy to implement uh, anything on a quantum machine. And particularly if we look at the uh, gate errors and all, uh, like it's, it's, it's uh, like, uh, I don't know how much it is possible, but we ought to look at this because, uh, of course, because um, we have to have estimates. So even if we are not uh, getting a practical attack, I mean, like because of the implementation issues, at least we can have, we should be having good estimates of the complexity of the attack so that we know how safe we are and what we have to do to keep ourselves safe. So that's all that I wanted to say. And thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, did you able to hear me? I mean, I don't know. I mean, like uh, we were able to of... hear you perfectly. Oh, I'm uh, I'm so happy because you know I was thinking that I'm sitting in a um, empty room and speaking to no one, but I'm glad that you are. No, you professor, we were able to hear you perfectly, okay. and yeah, okay. much thanks for that insightful presentation, yeah. and thank you for being with us today.